health outcome. Effectively designed parks can enhance public safety, improve public health outcomes, build community resilience, and provide opportunities for joy and learning that transform communities. Today, we are honored to have one of the leading voices in park equity and design. Before we introduce our distinguished guest, I would like to acknowledge our sponsors and share a few words about the San Diego Parks Foundation. This webinar was made possible by a generous contribution by the Schmidt Design Group. The Schmidt Design Group is a leader in park design and has been a tremendous thought partner to the San Diego Parks Foundation. I'd also like to thank the numerous community-based organizations that have helped us promote this event. Thank you to all of our community sponsors, the City of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department, Thrive Outside at the San Diego Foundation, the APA Chapter of San Diego, the Friends of Balboa Park, the Balboa Park Conservancy, the Jacob Center for Neighborhood Innovation, and Citizens Coordinate for Century 3. We thank you all. Now, I would like to share a few words about the San Diego Parks Foundation. The San Diego Parks Foundation was established in 2018 as an independent 501c3. It was established in collaboration with the City of San Diego's Park and Recreation Department by a group of dedicated community leaders inspired to create a more equitable park system. We are working to make San Diego a world-class inclusive park system by bringing philanthropic and volunteer resources to San Diego's most neglected community and neighborhood parks. Quality parks create healthier, healthy and safer communities. Parks not only improve the quality of life and physical health, but provide venues to bring people together across social, economic and racial divides to build more resilient, socially connected communities. In addition, expanding green space reduces pollution, provides natural habitat to support biodiversity and enhance climate resiliency. The San Diego Parks Foundation has raised more than $1 million to support environmental and recreational programs, as well as facility upgrades for San Diego's most neglected community and neighborhood parks. Thanks to our program partner, Locket Free Wi-Fi San Diego, our Parks Foundation has, provide, has funded and installed free Wi-Fi at 25 city recreation centers. This initiative focuses on improving digital access for seniors and for youth who visit parks and rely on the centers for places of social and community connection. Our Parks Foundation recently received funding to expand the program to all recreation centers. And this summer, we will be supporting outreach for the Emergency Broadband Program, EBB, to connect eligible San Diegans. To help the San Diego Parks and Recreation Department expand its capacity to provide food service, the San Diego Parks Foundation has provided the equipment and supplies to ensure the distribution of more than 300,000 meals since the beginning of the pandemic. We are grateful for Albertson's companies and the partnership that we've established with them. And we appreciate their ongoing commitment for the betterment of kids who may otherwise go hungry. The San Diego Parks Foundation launched a tree planning program in 2020 to help the city of San Diego meet its climate action goals and was able to plant nearly 100 trees in its first year. In 2021, 2022, we will plant nearly 200 trees in nine parks. Expanding green space reduces pollution, provides natural habitat to support biodiversity and enhances climate resiliency. Recent accomplishments and planned projects include 
23 trees planted at the Mountain View Park, 40 trees planted for Willie Henderson in progress, and another 32 trees at Southcrest Park. We are thankful for all of our sponsors. These include SDG&E, the Hervey Family Foundation, BeQuest Foundation, the Jack and, Ch and Jan Chatton Brown Fund, and the Hunter Industries. One area that we are focusing on is enhancing the offerings of recreational programs at the City of San Diego Recreation Centers. Thanks to the leadership and a lead grant from the County of San Diego and Price Philanthropies, the San Diego Parks Foundation and the City of San Diego Parks and Rec Department have launched Come Play Outside. Come Play Outside organizes and funds programs such as aquatics, adventure camp, teen night, and movies in the park in 21 recreation centers and aquatic centers across San Diego's south and central neighborhoods. The San Diego Parks Foundation works closely with the Parks and Rec Department to identify and fund meaningful recreation programs. Currently, we are working with the Park and Rec Department to refurbish the old San Isidro Library and to a vibrant community center. We recently raised the funds necessary to revitalize the Southcrest Recreation Center and install, and we will install facility upgrades to the Linda Vista Community Park. We are thrilled this morning that all of you were able to be here and to join us in this important community conversation. While we are proud of the work we have been able to accomplish, this is just the beginning. And we hope that you can join us in our work. There are several ways that you can get involved. Please look to the chat for the membership link and our executive director, Catherine Johnson's contact information if you have any questions. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the Parks and Recreation Director Mr. Andy Field to say a few words. Andy. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Andy Field, and I'm the Director of the Parks and Recreation Department for the City of San Diego, and it's very exciting to have such a distinguished speaker here with us today to discuss the importance of our parks and to have so many engaged citizens interested in park development and our work. First, I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to the sponsors, as Michelle mentioned. Without you, this would not be possible. The San Diego Parks Foundation has been a great partner and has assembled a great group of community partners today to join us for this discussion. This really demonstrates the Parks Foundation's commitment to engaging the community and creating a more equitable park system. Now, a little bit about the City of San Diego Park System. Our vision is to connect all to the city's diverse, world-class park system, and our mission is to provide healthy, sustainable, and enriching environments for all. Here are some numbers to help understand the size and complexity of our park system. We manage over 42,000 acres of park acres, more than 450 individual parks, 26 miles of combined shoreline and bayfront 59 recreation centers, 13 swimming pools, nine skate parks, 103 joint use areas, and three golf complexes. Included in these totals are iconic spaces, such as Balboa Park, Mission Bay Park, Mission Trails Regional Park, and Torrey Pines Golf Course, which hosts the 101st US Open Championship later this week. Our budget is more than $150 million annually, and at full capacity, we have more than a thousand full-time equivalent positions or over 1400 employees. As you may be aware, San Diego, like any city its size, has facilities and programs that are not equitably distributed. In fact, the Park and Recreation Board plans to consider the draft Parks Master Plan for the city of San Diego on this coming Thursday. This plan speaks towards establishing equity for park facilities and programs and will be the first policy document to make equity a focal point for the city's parks system going forward. All of this is happening as we hopefully leave the COVID-19 pandemic behind us. And during that time, we saw many staff leave the city during the pandemic. And in case you haven't already heard, we are hiring. 
please, if you're interested in some of our jobs that are range from entry level all the way up to management, visit sandiego.gov to learn more about our many job opportunities. And so to close my piece today, I wanted to thank you all for being here and for joining us in the, for this very important conversation today. And now I'd like to introduce Bill Anderson from the San Diego Parks Foundation. Many of you may know Bill. He is a leader in parks planning, having served as the city of San Diego planning director. And he has served in several prestigious planning positions, including a fellow of the American Institute for Certified Planners. He was the former national president of the 38,000 member American Planning Association from 2013 through 2015, president of the California Planning Roundtable. And from 1995 to 2003, Bill served as a member and chair of the City of San Diego's Planning Commission and was president of Citizens Coordinate for Century Three in the early 1990s. For today's conversation, Bill will be moderating, moderating and I'd like to turn over to Bill. Hey, thanks, Andy. Let's see, let me get this. Hello, everyone, welcome to um, uh, to this webinar, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Commissioner Silver. Uh, and Commissioner Silver is the um, Commissioner for New York City Parks and oversees the management, planning, and operations of nearly 30,000 um, 30, acres of parkland. Uh, he's known for innovative projects, including Community Parks Equity Initiative, Parks Without Borders, Cool Pools, and Creative Courts. Uh, the position he holds uh, has, used to be held in the late 50s and early 60s by Robert Moses. And I would have to say, speculate, that Jane Jacobs would have been pleased with Mitch if he was the park commissioner back then and may never have written her book if Mitch was park commissioner. So we're glad that, that Mitch was um, born a little later <laughs> in the century. Um, New York City is the largest with 8.3 million residents. It's a metro area of 24 million people and of course a world-class uh, cultural and uh, visitor destination. But Mitch previously was planning director of the city of Raleigh a city of about 500,000 people, but one of the most rapidly growing innovative cities in the country in a metro area of 1.2 million. So Mitch has that background of understanding both the major urban centers, but also the issues associated with growing, uh, growing cities and regions. Uh, Mitch was the president of the American Planning Association from 2011 to 2013 and the first African-American to hold that prestigious position. And I would like to uh, welcome Mitch to uh, San Diego electronically. Well, well thank you and uh, good morning, Michelle. Uh, thank you for that overview, uh, very well done. And, and Andy, uh, good to hear your context about the park system and just a, a hat tip to my colleague uh, who's running parks uh, across the country and of course, Bill, a good friend of mine uh, and very, very delighted about the work that you're doing. So I'm going to begin, uh, very excited uh, about this presentation. If some of you don't know, uh, my term as commissioner is coming to an end, it's a point of position. And so uh, I'll be, oh, I have to do my screen share and I'll be returning uh, to North Carolina as a consultant. Uh, so, see here. There we go. Uh, so before I begin, uh, there's a little uh, story I like to tell. Um, so I was a planning director in North Carolina and I was appointed parks commissioner, worked in parks, but not exclusively. And I'll never forget when my colleagues in planning said, I can't believe you're going to parks and not planning, you're such a sellout. It kind of hurt my feelings, uh, but it was funny. A year later, we had the National Planning Conference in New York City and working in parks, I realized something very different. I mean, people literally hugged me for opening up a park. And I had to reflect as I was talking to the opening session at the planning conference. And I told my colleagues, I said, you know something? People hug you when you open up a park. And in my entire career, no one ever hugged me for preparing a general plan. So I told them planners, if you want a hug, 
get involved in parks. And so I'm very delighted to share this presentation. Uh, I do appreciate uh, what Andy said. I wanted to give an overview of our park system. You have a large city, we have a large city. Uh, we have 30,000 acres of that, 10,000 natural areas, close to 2,000 parks. We oversee monuments, beaches. We have a 155 mile coastline uh, of our parks of New York City's 520 miles. But I also wanna call your attention to our community groups. Uh, we'll talk later during Q&A, but we're engaged in well over 1,800 community groups that help us program our parks, clean our parks, watch over our parks. And that is something that amazed me when I came to New York. So it's something that uh, we're very, very excited about because I don't think we can do what we do without our park partners. We also have conservancies and foundations, and I'll get to that hopefully in the Q&A. And then in terms of our staff, uh, over 7,000, we go up to 10,000 in the summertime with our lifeguards and our seasonals. So it is a very, very big uh, park system. I now wanna just focus on uh, the context uh, and, and take a step back. And by the way, if you look at that door behind me, as Bill mentioned, that was Robert Moses' office. Uh, that, that's our conference room. My ego is not that big, so I don't need something that large. And Bill, I am considering renaming that Robert Moses conference room to the Jane Jacobs conference room before I leave. So I'm kind of excited about doing that to get some equal justice. So if we look back at our park system in the mid 19th century, there were primarily parks and gardens. There were spaces that you looked at, you walked through, really didn't picnic, really didn't have any active recreation, you just strolled and observed the beautiful gardens. Then we get to the late 19th century, early 20th century, and this profession called landscape architecture emerged, where we took land and we actually molded it and shaped it for the public to enjoy. This is a Bethesda Terrace a Central Park designed by uh, Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted. And this really started a movement where people purposely now start to take these spaces, democratic space, regardless of race or income, was free and you can all enjoy. And that legacy really started back then and continues to this very day. Then we came to the Robert Moses era where it became parks and recreation. It started during this period in the 1930s when children literally dying in the streets and drowning in our rivers because there were no recreational out, uh, assets for people to enjoy. And so here's one of our pools uh, in High Bridge in Northern Manhattan. And we started building all these facilities throughout the entire uh, city to really help people uh, enjoy themselves and, and stop from drowning. Uh, believe it or not, I think all drowning stopped in the East River once we started opening up these pools. But then that era kind of ended around the 1965 with the demise of Robert Moses, but the name of Parks and Rec stuck, stuck. And then we came to this environmental movement, which is one of my favorite movements, because as we saw the industrial and manufacturing decline in our country, we had all this leftover land that was contaminated and unloved. And so cities started to give it back to the public. This is Riverside South uh, in Manhattan. This used to be an industrial shipping yard and now it's returned back to the public. So we healed this land and gave our best land, not for housing, but to the public to enjoy. And who knew this abandoned railroad on the west side, the High Line would become one of the top destinations in New York, 8 million visitors a year by just reclaiming these industrial spaces, not just here in New York, but throughout the country. And then who knew Brooklyn Bridge Park, where I grew up, this used to be another shipping location. Uh, now is a place you can kayak and enjoy the East River, unheard of. So the whole question is, that's the context, but now in the 21st century, what's next? And so that's when I came commissioner, we had this big conversation. In fact, the mayor hired me as a planner because he didn't want a typical person involved in operations. He wanted a new vision for the 21st century of what parks meant. And so we had to sit down with staff and come up with a new direction about what parks really meant in the 21st century. They're not just green spaces, but they're public spaces for people. It's not just an amenity, but a vital part of the city's infrastructure. Because we believe in climate change and so many of our parks are on the coast, we also know it's our first line of defense and not just against the water, but in terms of trees that are being planted. We planted a million trees uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years. Um, we also have more stormwater retention to make sure we have clean air, clean water, the heat island effect. But we also know that parks are not just for physical health, but also for mental well being. And we're also learning through this age of disruption that we're feeling, whether it's social, political, financial, that there's an awakening right now of the value of parks and public space. 
So for the purpose of this presentation, this is our strategic initiative. I'll just touch on two, uh, but you can see we're doing some other things as well. The one about caring is the one I enjoy talking about the most, and maybe I'll touch on that later, but I want to shift our staff away from just maintenance, which is checklist, to caring, which really comes from a different part of the soul. And so staff now gets it. It's not just maintenance, it's also caring for our parks, which is why our volunteers volunteer because they care for their public spaces and wanna make sure it is nurtured. So let me start first uh, with equity. By the way, this is Washington Square Park. That's been in the news quite a bit, uh, but this is Washington Square Park. So let's first start with equity. Now, a lot of people use different definitions for the word of equity. I use one, fairness. Are we fair about how we distribute our capital dollars? Are we fair about how we hire and promote and recruit our staff? Are we fair about how we maintain our public spaces? Are we fair in how we distribute all the improvements citywide? And so when I came on board, I had to find out, were we here in New York City being fair? So the mayor challenged me very quickly. The first initiative was he hired me to come up uh, with a, he ran on a platform of a tale of two cities and wanted to figure out how we can be equitable going forward. So we came up with this framework for an equitable future. Uh, I was hired in May, but we got this done by October. And this to this day is driving all the work that we do. But to understand where we're being fair, we had to take a look back. And we realized that New York City spent close to $6 billion improving our parks over the last 20 years. We add a lot of acreage and we wanted to have a walk score where every New Yorker will live within a walk to a park. Right now at 81.5%, we're trying to get to 85% by 2030. But to me, it wasn't just about proximity. It was about quality because I can walk to one of these parks within a walk to a park and I will let my child or grandchild step foot in that public space. So always be careful with metrics. I know TPL says walk to a park, walk to a park. Yeah, I walked to some of those parks. I don't wanna go there again. And so I wanted to make sure we did something about it. So we had to understand what we being equitable. So we decided to use a number of about 250,000 and if you're in the park business, that's not a lot of money. How many parks receive less than $250,000 over 20 years. That's virtually neglect. And so it turned out of all of our 2000 parks, 215 saw little to no investment. And these were all located in areas that were underserved or under-resourced. And the mayor and I said, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's from kindergarten to college. A person growing up in that neighborhood saw it, no change in their public spaces, while they saw Central Park and Prospect Park and places like Balboa get this investment, theirs was left behind. And because our parks are so important, they're our front yard, our backyard, our outdoor living rooms, that's where people go to connect and thrive. It was not fair and we had to change it. So to the mayor's credit, I told him uh, I could be a visionary mayor, but without no money, it's just a nice dream. And so the mayor kept his word and gave me over $300 million to recreate 67 of the 215 parks. That's kind of phase one. We're now working on a phase two. Now that is a lot of money, but uh, we felt that we had to right past wrongs and make sure those communities got the investment. Now, we did some light touches immediately, but all these parks got a full transformation. We ripped it from the ground and rebuilt it. So it wasn't just a replacement in kind, it was a total rebuild. So, Here's one of those wonderful Robert Moses playgrounds. Isn't it exciting? You can go there and roll around on the asphalt. But this is a park that was in that 10 minute walk to a park. Now, how many would love to go there for an afternoon and spend some time with a friend? This is how sad New York City parks were. And this was your typical Robert Moses playground, asphalt. And my question is, is this a park or is this a parking lot? It was pretty sad. Now this one's a little bit better because it has a couple of trees and a bench. So I suppose you can go there and propose to someone, have a picnic. This too was within that walk score. And so that's why I always challenge people to be careful of these metrics because it's about quality, not about a metric proximity. So we decided to change the approach going forward. We wanted to, because we knew these were these town centers, neighborhood centers, so we started adding a lot more spray features uh, so people could cool off if they can't get to the beach or a pool. Adult fitness equipment wanted to be attractive for all ages from eight to 80 and beyond. We wanted to use vibrant colors to get away from that drab, dark asphalt and make them vibrant. And we changed our entire color palette 
not the traditional yellow, red, and blue play equipment. We started to go with a much more creative color to increase the play value, but color murals on handball walls, we did it all just to make sure that we wanted to pop and be vibrant. The public wanted to get rid of the asphalt. They wanted more green space, more landscaping. And most of the cases now, all of the new parks uh, include stormwater retention right within the park itself. And so now we increase maintenance, but the trade-off is the return on investment is you get these nice green places that people can enjoy. Also seating. If you come to New York City right now, I requested staff quadruple the number of seating in our public spaces. People want to go out there and enjoy. And the past with the slide you see to the right would not exist in New York City because there was fear the homeless would come and occupy the park. You know, that's some of the things we have to deal with. But from our perspective, seniors want a place to sit. They tend to sit at the edges, families with strollers, people with wheelchairs. We make sure all the tables have a place for those with a wheelchair. We just want to make sure our seniors age gracefully. And we now provide lots and lots more seating in our public spaces. So I'm gonna run through a couple of examples before and after. This one was renamed Antonetti uh, Playground. This is now called, Gar well, it was called Garrison Park. It's right next to Community College in the South Bronx, a very rough area. Uh, this is what it looked like before. Um, you know, what's interesting about this one is that uh, unlike the asphalt one I showed you before at Lafayette Playground, this one did have vegetation in the park. It wasn't all asphalt. Unfortunately, it looked like this. Now, I want you to pause for a second and tell me, and I'm sure Andy could tell you just looking at it, how, what, how did this happen? I mean, this is a space I'd want to bring my grandchild, but it's in a walk score. So I guess we're going on a walk score side. And this is what I felt we had to do something. I was embarrassed as commissioner. And so I knew it had to change. Too many stairs, not easy to get into. And so we decided to only have one set of stairs, all other access was through a new graded path, uh, multi-generational. It has right near community college. It has a nice square for students to learn, very interactive. Uh, and so this is what it looks like. And there's the community college in the background. This is a place, a spray uh, pad for the kids can play, lots of seating for seniors. And so this is what it looks like. It went from what you saw to this. And now that COVID is almost lifted, the community is in awe. And this is what it looks like right now. It opened up during COVID. And so I'm sure when school returns, the students are gonna be blown away. They now have a space that they didn't even think existed before because it looked so bad. 20 years, no investment. And now this is a vibrant public space that the public can enjoy. <clears throat> I wanna go back to Lafayette Playground because this too changed. Uh, we had a wonderful community meeting with residents. This is both an Asian and a Hispanic and black community. And excuse me, we were able to do a community meeting. Uh, this was the outcome, made sure there was an air for Tai Chi because that was popular, outdoor classrooms, it's near a high school. And this was completed about three years ago. So it went from that asphalt to this. Again, 20 years of neglect is now changing this community. They now have a quality space they can now call their own. Love this one as well. This is in the Bronx again. This is, excuse me, <clears throat> this is a Grand Avenue playground in the Bronx. A lot of bad activities to happen here, gambling, drinking. Uh, that's our typical uh, old play equipment, the yellow, the red, the blue, black safety surface, which we've now changed. And so when we closed it off, we were able to move out the bad activity. And then we got a community group to come in to basically become stewards. I'll never forget on opening day, there were over 250 people waiting to get into this public space and now this is what it looks like. It is now a dynamic space. I remember this woman in Spanish came up to me and says, muchas gracias. She was telling me that she could not go away on vacation with her kids. This is where they come each and every day. Until this day, this park is crowded and it moved away all the bad activity that used to occur there. And I'll never, this, was, this is the opening day. This is how many people were there. I'll never forget that little girl on this hot July day, feeling the spray of that mist on her face. This is the joy that you bring. This is why we do what we do. This was a space that was neglected. And the woman who headed up the community group that was out there opening day was in tears because she said, you didn't just give us a park back. You gave us a reason to live. This is why they thrive. And this is why they come there. Uh, the next slide I'm going to share with you is one that I always get emotional about because uh, it is a true story. 
Uh, it was another asphalt playground. It was opening day, uh, a tr major transformation. It was asphalt, we put in a synthetic turf, we put in a track, we put in benches, play equipment. A little boy Hispanic about eight years old would not come into the park, opening day. And so I asked one of my staff members to speak to this little boy about why he wouldn't come in. And he said he didn't go in because he didn't know how much it cost. It was that nice he thought he had to pay. There is a public space. And if you see the little boy, he's running around the track. His life's going to change. He had not seen a park like this in his neighborhood. So he thought for sure something this nice had to cost. It was free. And so I do this work because little boys like that and all the little boys in this neighborhood, their lives will be different because we took a new approach and we focused on areas that have been neglected for decades. And now it is a place people can be proud of. And the best part is all these new 60 parks that we're doing, none of them are being vandalized. They're being cared for and nurtured because if you respect the community with quality material, they will respect you back in return. We also decided 318 million, a lot of money. We looked at our municipal pools, many of them near public housing. In fact, that's one in the background. We decided to add dignity and respect to our municipal pools. This is what they look like, neglected, horrible. Uh, people didn't even want to go there. We decided with some paint and about $150,000 per pool, we did a total revamp and we called it Cool Pools. We wanted people to be cool, but also be cool. And so it went from this to this. We wanted this to be not just a pool, but a place, a destination. In fact, the community now calls this the resort. We've now transformed about 15 of our pools. This is one of them. Uh, we did all the color palettes ourselves with our design team. There are cabanas, there are umbrellas, there are Adirondack chairs of all sizes, there's cornhole. But the transformations have been amazing. If you see on the end there is Marco, Polo. I have a great staff that comes up with these cool ideas. Now, uh, the, it, it increased attendance by 50% where there are people now waiting online to get into this pool with just a little bit of respect, I'm sorry, a little bit of money and understanding about equity, respect and dignity, we're able to transform the experience uh, for all the people. And I'll be jumping in a pool next week as we open up the pools for our 2021 season. So we completed now 60 of the 67 parks. That really transformed 70 acres of parkland. Of all the parks we've done, 82% of them now have a friends group that help care for them. And we increased usership by over 50%. And this is everyone's favorite project, the mayor, the council, the community. Everyone loves this because they saw it was there before and now what was there after. All right, let me quickly go into uh, some other areas of access. And for us, access means to be free of physical, cultural, financial, and legal barriers. I'll get into that momentarily. I believe people eat and sleep in their apartments or homes, but they live in the public realm. And we wanna make sure we provide that amazing experience for the people who use our public spaces. I believe previous generations were consumers of goods, but the new generations are consumers of experiences. They want to be out there and enjoy themselves in that other space. So I challenge my staff, not just to be planners and designers, but to be experience builders. These are outdoor living rooms. How do people communicate and relate? And so we've changed the way we design our public spaces. So I'm challenging my staff to reimagine the public realm. What you're looking at is concrete. It was a street. And so when people say we don't have enough land to create a park, I said, do you have streets? They go, yeah, then you can create a park. This is the Flatiron District and it's Italy on one side and Madison Square Park on the other side. And just by putting some benches and chairs, we reclaimed underperforming asphalt because people enjoy the experience of being in this place. And so that gave us some thought about the public realm in New York City. Streets and sidewalks represents, uh, I'm sorry, parks represents 14% of the city. Streets and sidewalks represents 26%. That means that 40% of New York City is in the public realm, but the agencies don't act that way. Transportation said, this is my jurisdiction. Parks says that is our jurisdiction. So we decided to take a very different approach to see how we can work together. There's that same concrete island I shared with you before. You're looking at it now from above. And now we want to create this more seamless experience for our public to enjoy. Now, luckily, San Diego, you do not have fences and gates, but in New York, we do. 
And so when I became commissioner in our charter, uh, first thing Olmstead said is that the sidewalk adjacent to the park should be considered the outer park. And the charter said all sidewalks next to a park is under parks jurisdiction, not the Department of Transportation. So I became very excited. We just opened this park uh, last week. We have redone the sidewalk to be a bioswale because to me, that's not a sidewalk, that's the outer park. And that poor little dog just wants to smell some grass, but there's this big barrier fence that blocks them. So I started focusing in on these barriers that prevent access into our public spaces. This one, I could never figure out. I assume they thought the trees were gonna run away at night, so they put a fence around it. This fence has now been taken down, and this part of this park is now incorporated with the rest of the playground, so now people can enjoy it. It doesn't need to be fenced. People say, what do you mean? Don't take down the fence. It's gonna make the park less safe. This is not New York City in the 70s and 80s. We're now in the 21st century. When I told people, you, you don't want us to take down the fence, can you tell me what's happening halfway down the block? You can't, because the fence, even though it seems porous when you stand in front of it, actually becomes a barrier as you go down the block. Here's a, one of our pools, before cool pools. Uh, this is where the kids would have their summer lunch when they go into a pool program. The sad thing, it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. So what message are we sending our children when we have to cage them in just to have lunch? So luckily, because of the Parks Over Borders program and cool pools, this was now changed to this, more brighter colors, lowering the fence, you can actually see into it. And I can just tell you, the public has responded so positively. So this whole concept about this unified public realm really folded into what we call the Parks Without Borders program. The mayor gave me $50 million as a pilot, and now it's a permanent project because the public loves it so much. Initially, they were afraid about taking down fences or removing them. Now they've embraced it. The program is simple. It's a new design approach that looks at the entrances, the edges, and adjacent park spaces and tries to just change them and make it more seamless and connected to the public. Where we had fences, we now take it down so people are drawn right into the public spaces. If there's a fence, we lower it. We put benches on the sidewalk. Parks close, sidewalks never close. And so we wanna really build out that outer park experience. Lowering the fence improves the sight line, particularly for women uh, who wanna be able to see their surroundings and to have a sense of safety. And so we're just removing or lowering those fences so it improves the sight line. And then you'll see one example in a second. We've caged these wonderful, beautiful gardens for no apparent reason, and now we're unleashing them so the public can enjoy them. So let's go to one of the best examples of Parks Without Borders in Queens. It's called Travers Park. Uh, we work with DOT, Department of Transportation. We had a park, we had a street, and we had a school. We merged them all together to create about a 3.2 acre new park uh, by creating an all seamless experience. This is what it looked like before. Once again, there's a dog, nowhere to go. A guy's not looking into the park space because it's just asphalt with an 18 foot fence. But I want you to note where those trees are located because we then transformed this park that it went from this to this. You see where the trees are located right now? Now we have a tree well, it's more gracious. We removed the asphalt, created a mound. Uh, this now is everyone's popular park. And now they want to take 34th Street, which is bounded by this park, and create a linear park. And this was a driver. It was that popular. People are craving more green space in this community. And they can see what we could do from going from asphalt to a park. Uh, once again, uh, this is now technically the sidewalk. We made it the outer park by bringing that experience out and how the trees are now changed the experience where before it was just in Belgium block. Now it is part of the overall experience. Uh, there's a street that was demapped. People use it informally with a Jersey barrier, uh, but now it's been formalized as a connecting plaza between the park and the schoolyard place, which is further down on this slide. And then here's a completed image. Uh, here it is, park's closed, but people are still out there enjoying the quote unquote park. And you see the conversational conversations that are going on, people of all ages. You don't have to put benches side by side. They could be on an angle so people can have a conversation. This is what the park was meant to be. This is Parks Without Borders, taking down the barriers and providing experience that people can enjoy. Seward Park is another Parks Without Borders. I'll go through this one very quickly. Uh, this is where I was actually appointed as commissioner and the first municipal playground 
in the United States was right here at Seward Park. There's a library, but the library was fenced off. You couldn't get to it. There's the entrance to the library. You had to walk all the way around the block just to get into the library. It absolutely made no sense. Tall fence made no sense. So uh, we decided to lower the fence four feet. I want you to take a look at that guy. Once again, not looking into the public space because the high fence, it obscures his view. No reason to look in. Uh, and we came up with this plan to, to open up that fence to the library, create a nice plaza, uh, redo the garden, lower the fence. And this is what it looked like. You're now on the steps of the library. And you can see, if you look to your left, there's that locked fence. Even the garden had a fence around it. What we did was we transformed it. We opened up the plaza, lowered the fence, actually created a plaza in front of the library as well as a little reading amphitheater. And today you can see part of it, it looks like this. And now look at that. The man, and this wasn't staged, is now looking into the park because now the sight lot has improved. He can now enjoy the garden. There used to be a fence at the edge, a fence around the garden, and the opening to the library is succeeded. So I'm going to end on the parcel border pieces. This is in Brooklyn. It's called Gateway Triangle. One of a little green space, but it's fenced in for no reason. And so I told my staff, luckily we had trades. And so we got our blacksmiths to cut the fence. Our gardeners came in. And what you're about to see is unbelievable. This was low cost, didn't cost anything except staff work, took down the fence. And now we unleashed this beautiful green space that was hidden behind a fence more seamless and the joy people feel going to work, passing this garden to me is absolutely priceless. Now I'm gonna shift gears into inclusion. Uh, to me, I know it's one of the buzzwords we're having today. To me, when I say inclusion, it means to be included, not excluded. For all people in community engagement and the design process, avoiding designing exclusive parks and public spaces. I could design a park that makes people feel uncomfortable. When I'm in a space, I don't feel comfortable. I have to look at the clues why. And we wanna make sure that we design spaces and places that are welcoming and safe for all. Let me give you one example. Believe it or not, in New York City, we had signs in our parks that said, you can loiter. There it is. Now, loitering means to stand or wait around idly without an apparent purpose. Newsflash, that's what you do in a park. However, it could be weaponized. If you're a nice white couple sitting on a bench, oh, look at them, they look adorable. If you're five black or brown teenagers, it could be weaponized and say, you have to move along. You can't sit or stand around. The good news is in 2017, we removed loitering as a rule. So now we tell people you can loiter in our parks. In fact, we don't even use that word because we want our public spaces to be welcoming for all. So that's something that we had changed. In fact, we went a step further. Uh, we have an arts program and we initiated a yes loitering project in the Bronx. And this was a safety initiative for the youth to investigate how teens might feel excluded from or targeted in public space. Our message was young people, you are welcome, welcome in our public spaces. And for us, that was something that was critically important. Now, this is a creative court in Detroit. We now do this as well in New York City, but this one really moved me. This is Detroit Campus Marsh Park. In the center of downtown, Detroit, a majority black city, is revitalizing itself, doing a great job. And when they decided to do a downtown park, they put in a basketball court. Now, I have to tell you, most places do not want basketball in their downtown, and in some cases, they don't want it in their parks. But Detroit had the audacity to put a basketball court in the center of downtown, and the message was, this city is on a rise, and young people, you matter. You're included. That to me, when I saw this one, was such a powerful message. And that to me is what inclusion is all about. And when I've checked in with them, nothing bad happens there. Center of downtown, they're having a good time. This is seasonal, so it comes and goes. But this is a great way of showing people that you are included and you're welcome in our public spaces. This one shocked me, and this is a change happening in New York City. Uh, there was a change in demographics of the neighborhood. It went from football, people playing soccer, and they asked the Parks Department, not me, back then, to plant trees on a football field so people would not play soccer. I was so disturbed by that, I knew that was going to be on our list to change. This was one of our Anchor Park projects. And I'm pleased to tell you, after a lot of community consultation, the trees were taken away, the track was redone, and is now a soccer field for all to play. Football, soccer. And so for me, this is very gratifying to understand it wasn't fair 
that certain people weren't allowed <laughs> to play certain sports when a field is a field. And so now it's embracing uh, all those communities. I want to close on reflections about some of the disruptions that we're going through, because certainly parks has been playing a role. There's no question uh, COVID-19, which we now at least is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, all the civil and social unrest we experienced, and some cities like New York still experiencing it, really created a lot of disruption for us. And I started to really understand uh, that this is both stress and trauma. And here's all the ways you can feel it, physical, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, spiritual. Your residents are going through this. Right now, they're going through this. And the question is, what role can parks play on dealing with the stress and trauma, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's economic, whether it's political, people are going through stuff. In your city, in San Diego, and here in New York, we had to figure out a way of at least in a small measure how parks can address the stress and trauma that people are experiencing. I didn't just know this existed, but I took a seminar and we have something called the Trauma Stewardship Institute. And they talked about and shared this survival guide about what you can do to deal with stress and trauma. So we focused on the be active, the Maya art to laugh. And so I asked my staff to embrace this to show how we can play a role into just lightening things up for the community that's going through stress and trauma of all the areas that I mentioned. And so uh, we now realize that parks were places of joy. This is during COVID when I saw one of my running friends, you can kind of tell she's happy to see me, but, but that is, uh, she's, she's uh, Vanessa is an amazing individual who realized that these are places that express joy. And so the disruptions produced an awakening that parks really became these sanctuaries of sanity where people can go to connect with nature and feel alive. And in fact, parks have the power to heal. So we talk about all these places and neighbors that don't have quality parks, we're denying them the ability to heal and refresh and reset. And so that's why we double down on making sure we do not neglect these public spaces throughout our city. And New Yorkers became very creative during COVID about how they were gonna get outdoors and express themselves. Uh, we started putting up more monuments. Uh, and the one thing after Black Lives Matter, which I'm most proud of, is that we decided to create spaces for healing, for reflection, for joy, for celebration. And we came up with uh, and renamed a park in Brooklyn, Juneteenth Grove. The anniversary is coming up this Saturday. I'm announcing another 17 spaces tomorrow. Uh, but this is what staff came up with to really connect with what was going on across the country. Pan African colors, 19 benches, 19 trees were planted. Staff did the work themselves. Uh, I had the privilege of planting and praying one of the trees that I planted because I wanted to connect both those who passed, but also pray for those who will follow us. And the tree uh, represented that symbol. And so as I stated, we started naming public spaces to really show they wanted to be fair, but diverse and inclusive. And I'm naming another 17 spaces publicly tomorrow throughout New York City to tell the Black experience and their stories. So as I close, I hope you got a full understanding of what we're doing here, but our goal here in New York City is to create an equitable and inclusive park system that is accessible to all and has the power to heal and bring joy to present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. That, that was really an inspiring presentation, I have to say. I've seen many of your presentations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank they're, you. they're all great, but th this is uh, on top of the list. Um, let me start my video so I get on. Uh, we're now we're we're going to. Uh, I'll start off with a few questions while people are formulating their their questions. But please, I did see uh, one. Uh, put one your, which uh, this is a good question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Put your questions into Q and A. And uh, and uh, and we have a really a, a half hour to um, uh, to have a conversation. Um, so while you're doing that, one question I had is, and this is from your perspective of both being a planning director in a city and a parks commissioner in a city, is a lot of the innovations you've talked about especially parks without borders and linkages, reusing the streets and reclaiming public space 
uh, dealing with uh, uh, enhancing accessibility requires a lot of coordination of different functions and departments within a city bureaucracy. Right. Um, what advice do you have to other cities on how to navigate that process to achieve what you've achieved? Well, um, when, in 2014, I announced that we needed to have kind of a czar of the public realm. Uh, and so a lot of people thought I was vying for a new job. Uh, but we came up with a public realm team. What is important is that message has to come from the city manager or the mayor and put it in the director's performance evaluation. You are now charged to wake, work together as a team. If not, you need to move on to another position. So in Raleigh, uh, my boss, uh, when we did a conference and planning process, actually put that in their performance evaluation that he measured them. It wasn't the plan department's comprehensive plan, it's the city's comprehensive plan. And for this one, the mayor charged the commissioners to work together to achieve these goals. So it has to come from, a, from uh, the top. If not, you have these jurisdictional values where each commissioner or director believes this is my territory, but a city is not built on silos. These systems work together and you have to work together or it does not work. So we work with planning. We work with environmental protection on stormwater. We work uh, with Department of Transportation on demapping streets. In fact, they were so happy. There were some streets they wanted to demap that we just work so well together. So it has to come from the top. And if you want to take it a step further, you've got to put it in the performance evaluation to show how have you worked with your other you know, agencies on these topics. So, uh, but in New York, I was very blessed. I got along with my colleagues, we collaborated and a lot of projects you've seen from Montefiore, I won't mention them because some of the people here won't know what they are, but we actually did DMAP streets. Now streets can't be, you can't have a grass over it because you need to keep it open for the infrastructure underneath, but it worked well. So it has to come from the top uh, or you just have to foster a very good relationship um, with your colleagues and other agencies. We did both. Do, do some of your, your, your trails, whether they're pedestrian trails or bike trails, recreational trails, are, are they integrated into your circulation system, considered they actually for circulation? Yeah, there's been a heavy focus on the bike lanes, on streets. Uh, I just am leaving soon, but we started Destination Greenways, which is to elevate our greenways and our parks a lot better. I went to Minneapolis and got quite jealous. And so now we're trying to change our greenways and our parks. They're gonna connect to the bicycle system but we want to make sure they're uh, improved a lot more uh, and that they're for running, biking, walking, because uh, clearly you can't do some of that on the street with the bikeways, but the answer is yes. There's been a big push right now uh, to connect our greenways to the bicycle network, street bicycle network. Okay. Yeah. You know, there were, there were a couple of questions related to um, uh, land and, um, and that, priority in terms of adding more land as the city's growing and New York City has been growing in the last uh, uh, several decades um, versus enhancing the utilization of your existing parks. How, how do you approach, uh, given that you know, you're, you're an urban city, how do you approach that question? I've, I'm the commissioner that focused on fixing our existing parks. My, what I say is let's make old parks new again. It's hard for me to build another park when I see so many that hadn't seen investment in decades. Having said that, uh, we don't have a lot of land. Uh, a lot of the waterfront, as we're now seeing rezonings from industrial to residential, they're required to build out waterfront parks, but it doesn't reach all the neighbors I wanted to. So we're doing a lot of schoolyards to playgrounds conversion because there's not a lot of land left. We still acquire land, uh, but my, my primary focus is on fixing the parks that we have because it's very tough. Like if you buy a house and there's mold in the basement, let's have a patio, but I'm like, you know, we got to fix the mold in the basement first. Uh, and so I focused on fixing uh, our neglected infrastructure and parks. Uh, and then we will focus on some of the new acquisitions, but I focus more on fixing the, what we have versus building new. I think one question, I think it was from Roger Scholey uh, here. Uh, did, uh, are you looking at landfills, reclaiming landfills, older yes. landfills? And, and We've done uh, quite a few. Uh, almost all of our landfills, after you cap them, and I've learned between 
commercial grade and residential grade and cap. Uh -huh. So the answer is yes, we're not allowed. We don't trash any of our garbage here any longer in New York City. It's all barged out. So uh, Fresh Kills, over 2,000 acres. Uh, that one is the one that um, is going to be our largest park once completed. So that one's being done. But almost all of our um, uh, landfills have been capped and covered. Uh, and we're waiting for enough time when they're safe uh, to use. Um, so we're doing portions of it at a time, but I'm learning the difference between commercial grade fill and residential grade fill. Uh, but now some of them being used more as passive parks for just strolling and not active recreation. Okay. Um, several questions were kind of the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, basic question was, how do, how do you fund all this? How do you fund acquisition, rehab, um, even the programming that goes with the- um, It's the part of the capital budget. Uh, these are bond mm -hmm. money. It's, it's all part of our capital budget. And uh, New York, uh, we're a city of 8 million people. And uh, my budget, I don't know if you saw the slide, um, it's about 1.2 to 1.8 billion every year to build parks. Um, a lot of that is uh, earmarked by the mayor for specific projects. I make, rec make recommendations to the mayor but then city council put some in, uh, we have borough presidents, our county executives put some in and our state legislators. For the most part, I would say about 65% of the funding comes through the mayor's office, the balance from the other elected officials, but it's, cap it's, it's bonds. It's bonds that we borrow the money, uh, but my budget, like I said, is about 1.2 to 1.8 billion uh, every year to- And, and, and the bonds are- Bonds are serviced by general funds or do you have yes. a special tax district or, okay? No, not tax district. No, this is just general obligation bonds. Okay, and how do you compare that with, uh, in Raleigh you had impact fees, right? Like uh, other- We had impact fees for parks. It was a small measure, but they did, would go to a referendum. So mm -hmm. anything that they wanted to have a parks bond, it would go out to the public. They would delineate the parks or the districts they wanted to improve, and then they vote on them. Those packages were around a hundred million, anywhere from 80 to 100 million. Uh, they try to miss that 100 because it got people a little bit leery about paying additional taxes for that. But in Raleigh, we had to do both transportation bonds and park bonds went to, and school bonds. All those went to the public to be voted. They don't do that in New York City. <laughs> yeah, well, it just uh, on Raleigh and, and going to the voters, uh, what's your advice on how to make the case to the voters to- They generally pass. School bonds had a tough time until they didn't pass it one year. And then people had to go to school in trailers. And so they understood it was growing so fast. People didn't want to pay additional taxes. They generally pass. So it's very strategic about how much you put out there to be voted on. But uh, people love parks and their greenways and trails. Uh, and so uh, they generally pass. They just always poll to see what size uh, the public, what their appetite is for but transportation bonds, park bonds, in addition to what they collect for impact fees, the way it's done is they do it by areas. So if you get mm -hmm. a, you know, it's done by a different service area. So those impact fees, once you gather them, it's not that much, but it does help. But uh, they're very good at selling uh, the advantages of having these, um, these projects. Uh, there are a couple of questions related to um, gentrification. Uh, as you uh, design and improve these parks in, in some communities, do you get any uh, concern from, from the people living in that community that you're just setting it up to attract new investment, new people, and eventually- You hear that, but I debunk it. Um, other than the High Line, I don't know of any park I'm aware of uh, that led to gentrification, particularly a neighborhood park. Uh, the, the danger of that is, uh, as I told you, there are some parks that have been neglected for decades. If you do nothing, people accuse you of neglect. If you do something, they accuse you of gentrification. So if I'm in a no-win situation, I can't go to that little eight-year-old boy and say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to live within fear park because your neighbors across the street think that this park will lead to gentrification. So I'll take the punishment because my goal is to make sure we have quality space for all. I have not seen our park improvements, neighborhood parks lead to gentrification. Uh, so I do know people use that uh, to stop a park improvement, but I have not seen that. And I've now completed over 850 capital projects as commissioner. And I have not seen any case of where a neighbor park led to gentrification. Okay. Do, do you, um, uh, 
use um, privately owned, publicly accessible parks as part of your strategy? Not under parks, uh, city planning, when they negotiate bonuses for developers, uh, it doesn't come under our portfolio that's under the management of the department city planning, but they do exist. Uh, it is part of our open space network. City planning is very good at the rules uh, that they have to follow. Uh, but my everything I'm under jurisdiction is fully, fully, but for concessions, everything we operate is free and open to the public at all times. It's not a privately owned public space. Oh, okay. Let me see. Uh, looking at more more questions here, but the the um, uh, in trying to integrate social value into a community, uh, how, how do you approach the public input process uh, and distinguish between um, you know direct input from people? versus are they really representing the people of the community? That question. Well, we have a team uh, called, uh, we have outreach coordinators who know the community very well. Number one, uh, we don't just plan for who shows up at the public meeting because they could always stack the deck. So we do our homework, we do our outreach to make sure the demographics of that community is represented in a public meeting. If it's not, then we go out to do a little bit more additional outreach. We want to make sure we hear all voices. We don't just want to plan for those that show up at the public meeting. Virtual has been a little bit different, uh, but that is a goal of ours because we want to make sure we're inclusive and we hear all the voices. So that to me is first and foremost. And we do have public outreach meetings for every single one of our capital projects, everyone. Now, do you, does, do you um, incorporate parks or improvements or fund the parks and improvements to serve um, the, the many people who work in New York, but don't live in New sure. York. Absolutely. Uh, we get 100, so, yeah, we get 100. You, before COVID, we were getting 130 million visits to our parks every year. Our parks are part of our tourism, and I'm actually on the tourism board. Um, with COVID, it's of course changed, but they become major destinations. And so, yes, the Highland actually gets more visitors from out of town than New Yorkers, Central Park, all of those. Central Park, 42 million just by itself. So the answer to your question is yes, we design and build and care for our parks for our New Yorkers, but also for our vis visitors as part of the New York experience when you come to New York. Do you, do you tap uh, uh, tourism fiscal revenue uh, to help pay for park improvements? No, no, we don't. Um, what we, we, we don't have that set up here. We do have conservancies that help uh, operate and maintain our parks. We have our concessions, which I mentioned, 400, generates about $64 million a year, goes into the general fund. Uh, but we do not right now tap into tourism. Everything we get is just out of our expense funding, which is tax levy dollars that comes through our taxes and other fees. So uh, our budget's about a uh, little over half a billion dollars, uh, but all that comes from uh, just from, uh, from taxes property income, et cetera. Yeah, well, you know, uh, your presentation uh, rightfully so uh, touched on uh, uh, or covered uh, community and neighborhood parks, but can you talk a little bit about your strategy and, and how do you fund improvements for your, your great landmark parks, uh, you know, Central Park in particular? It, it, it depends. The city will always put up some capital dollars uh, we do have about eight conservancies, Central Park being probably the most well-known conservancy. Their budget is 65 million. They raise about two thirds of that 65 million from all the patrons around the park and, and members. Uh, so they do get folks. Uh, we're now rebuilding Lasker Pool uh, near Harlem. Uh, we gave 50 million. They've raised uh, about 175 million uh, just from uh, New Yorkers who care about Central Park. Uh, Prospect Park, uh, the High Line, Madison Square. So a few of our parks have conservancies. And so we have an agreement with them that they can operate on our behalf, but that they get a portion of the fees for their special events to raise the funds to help maintain the park. If a conservancy park has an event, there's a split, they get some, the city gets some. A non-conservancy park, if I have an event, it goes directly into the general fund. So these conservancies <clears throat> serve as somewhat of a nonprofit, the funds they make get reinvested back into the park. So some would argue that those parks are doing better because they have that mechanism 
But to operate a park, it's very expensive. And so we ask groups that want to do that to start small and grow. I like they're trying to do right now in Flushing Meadows Corona Park where they have the US open. They want to grow into a full-fledged conservancy. They're starting small, uh, but that's something we welcome because once you generate those fees, it gets reinvested back into the park so it does not have to come out of the city, at least all of it, come out of the city's budget. Well, on parks like Central Park, do, do you kind of categorize that as this is a separate park that serves the whole population or is it also a neighborhood park for the um, communities next to it? It's both, it's both. So on the east side and west side of Manhattan, they use that, there are playgrounds, only one basketball court, tennis courts. So there are ball fields. So on the edges, yes, people do penetrate from Harlem and the North, they go in there. So the answer is yes, but it's also a regional park. It's our most visited park in New York City. And I don't know if it's the world, but 42 million is a lot of visitors every year. Uh, and so that's, that's the number. It's a regional park, but also to many, their local park. Okay. You went one of the questions too back on the uh, land because I, I know as you mentioned your your, your priority is in charge has been uh, renovation and uh, enhancements of existing parks. But is there is there a formal plan or or strategy for the longer term acquisition of land? Yes. Uh, for parks and uh, and does that inform the um, development agreements and negotiations that? planning and economic development undertakes when they're um, entitling property? Yes, uh, there's waterfront plans. We have 525 miles of coast and, and typically in Brooklyn, Manhattan, if you're gonna build anything near the waterfront, it's right built in. Uh, if it's not the rezoning with restrictive declaration, which is I guess similar to what you call these community benefit agreement, it is set aside. They have to build a portion of that waterfront. Uh, in other places, uh, not necessarily the case. Uh, unless we purchase a large industrial property like Brooklyn Bridge, where a portion of it was leased for development, the other portion was built as a park. Uh, but aside from that, it's we're land scarce, so there's not a lot of land to purchase. So what we do is we do a lot of conversions from schoolyards to playgrounds, and now we're looking at demapping streets in order to increase the footprint of a park. But again, because of the street, there's only so much we can do within the bed of the street because there's infrastructure underneath. So we do a lot of those. And then now we're closing about 60 miles of streets uh, as open streets permanently. Mm -hmm. uh, so while it's not a park per se, there are now these streets that are closed so that people who don't have access to open space now can play on a street like we did when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have any, uh, uh, any uh, parks or, or facilities like uh, uh, gymnasiums and, and such that oh. are on rooftops? No, not rooftops, no. Parks in the sky. Okay. Correct. Not 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 in the parks, to my knowledge. No, we have green roofs up there, but not yeah. active recreation. No. Okay. Um, let's see. The um, uh, new urbanism. They're asking. Yeah, new urban. I saw Howard's question there. Yeah. Um, they reached out to me. Uh, I told them very clearly uh, that I was concerned about their approach to diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, and so I joined uh, recently for that reason. Um, and so I saw them moving in that direction. And so um, I'm not retiring entirely, but uh, I wanted to make sure, um, I'm sorry, the question is, what was your motivation or inspiration for joining the Congress of New Urbanism Board of Directors? I just joined this month. Uh, the former uh, executive director CEO reached out to me. Uh, I participated in a jury and I was very passionate about everything you saw in this presentation about diversity, equity, inclusion. I felt new urbanism wasn't there yet. It was more focused on the built environment versus the people. And so they felt my voice was needed on the board. So I agreed to join the board and to make sure they do advance diversity, equity, inclusion uh, in the work that they do, uh, but also in attracting more diverse members. Yeah, and, and you're, and you're currently the president of AICP, right? And I am. <laughs> Congratulations. And on this and the City Parks Alliance board, but I'm rolling. <laughs> and I am committed to only being on one board <laughs> in years because um, I realize what it's like to be on three or four boards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Howard, just so you know, because I, I know Mitch, you started it, and and when I was president, and since uh, we at APA, we've really been working to uh, develop um, partnerships with the other allied uh, organizations, 
CNU and ASLA, AIA and ULI. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I thought I had a lot of energy. As I'm getting older, I'm, I'm going to chill a little bit. So uh, <laughs> I don't have the same energy back then when I was president, but I still have some left. Um, I don't know if you want me to look at some of these questions. Uh, how is, oh, the answer question about 318 million. Um, oh, maintenance, the question about maintenance. Um, so our maintenance is that we uh, look at the number of parks and the activity the parks get. And so we're able to, we do it by, New York has five boroughs. And so we look at the acreage and then the service that they get. In other words, how many people use the parks so we have service level agreements for each park, and that lets us know how many people have to go in the park to service it once a week, once a day, three times a day. And so that's how we apportion. But typically, uh, if we get a new park, our budget will be increased. We just got more for a new park in Staten Island. So when we get more staff, uh, typically the mayor's office will give us the funds so that we make sure we have the adequate staff to take care of expanded public space. So that's the only downside when you increase your park space that increases Maintenance staff, vehicles, you know, all that comes along Ramming. with it. It's not new park space, it's staff, it's vehicles, and all the fringe benefits that come along with it, and supervision. So that's something you have to be mindful of. When you increase your park system, you also increase the bodies and the equipment to take care of the parks. Uh, I, this may have come from somebody who's a consultant, and, and I'm a consultant, uh, but is the, um, to what extent, extent when you're designing parks you do it in-house with your department resources versus uh outside okay another shocker uh so i'm told i'm the largest employer of landscape architects on the planet uh maybe <laughs> calm you may beg to differ uh so we have 400 uh landscape architects architects and engineers uh in our division and uh in in queens and they basically do we separate it between sites and building sites is when it's just a park with no structure. So we do 80% of that in-house. We outsource 20% because we have such a large volume of work. For buildings, it's about 30% we do in-house and 70% of that work we outsource. So that's the breakdown. They're pretty busy. Uh, Cause like I said, we have over 500 projects. And so we typically have a third in design, a third in procurement and a third in construction. But I would say the vast majority of our sites are done in-house. Can, can you talk about that a little bit and expand I, into the planning world as well? Is and I, I think I know the answer. No, you know conversations we've had in the past. How important is it to have design capabilities within a city? Oh, it is absolutely important. Uh, number one, they're super talented, and I think when I came here they were not getting their due. I mean, Parks was known for just cutting grass and pruning trees. But when I saw these talented landscape architects, all the stuff I showed you, that was all done, except for, I think, Seward Park. That was all done in-house. Uh, and so to me, it's absolutely important. They understand my philosophy. Parks Out Borders is now a permanent program. They have re If you saw the old to the new, it's totally different. Uh, so to me, it is so invaluable. It saves money, it saves time. Uh, they know, and we test out everything from safety surface to play equipment, everything in there, we have studied to pick the very best material for durability, for cost, and they just do this by rote. You know that many projects, you know exactly the manufacturer you want to work with, you know exactly what you need to do, you know the contractors very well. Can you touch on how technology is changing the way we plan parks, design parks, but also use parks? Yeah. So, uh, you probably saw a lot of innovation and technology. So we've revolutionized. Uh, we now have what's called PIP, our parks inspection program. They go out and inspect every park and they record what they do on their phone. And so that then feeds into, uh, we kind of call it parks stat. So we meet monthly and it tells us the conditions of park, who's suffering, who's not suffering. So that is a great tool, a dashboard that lets us know exactly where we need to focus our attention on underperforming parks for routing our trucks or packers to pick up trash. We now shifted to more technology. So we're now better able to pick it up because we have these places where we drop off the trash, you know, uh, at the stations that everything has to be timed. So we use technology for that. How we assign staff to parks. We now have an app that figures out where they work and where they live to minimize their distance for commuting. Uh, so the analytics we're now using to take care of our parks is phenomenal. 
And now we actually ping people's cell phones. Privacy is not a concern. So we figure out how many people are using our parks, but their phone has to be turned on, but we don't take any personal data. It just lets us know how many people are using our park. So we're able to count. Um, and so that's another technique that we use. And you have to purchase that cell phone data, but it's out there. We don't do it ourselves. We actually buy it from a company. Do you, do you have any uh, surface or underground parking or parking structures in your parks? Not exactly. We have cultural facilities uh, like Museum of Natural History, Lincoln Center, which is parks. So as a cultural institution, there's parking underneath. But other than, and it's a park asset, but it's not a park per se, except for the Museum of Natural History, it's Theodore Roosevelt Park. Uh, but other than that, no, we don't put parking on either box. And what you do, do you charge for parking? No, we don't. The cultural facilities do, we don't. Okay. All parking is free. But because of our subway system, uh, most people, unless they're out in the lower density part of the city, um, most people can find parking or there's a parking lot inside the park. Uh, one question here uh, from one of our community development organizations is uh, your assertion that parks are a mechanism for community healing is, is beautiful. Uh, rare to hear in this context. Can you say more about that? How, how... <laughs> I could, well, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Um, that is probably even part personal. Um, I was coming to work the whole time um, from COVID, coming to work. Our staff were essential workers, watching what they were going through, understanding that class uh, that I shared with you that I took in the summertime, uh, and then Black Lives Matter, it broke me. That, that whole incident with George Floyd as a black man broke me. And by August, I probably was one of the darkest moments of my life between managing during COVID, Black Lives Matter, going through my own personal stress and trauma for what I was seeing as a, a man of color, that I knew uh, that, as I told you, taken, I took a self-care class because I was getting very concerned, the dark place that I was in, knowing my staff and my senior team felt the same way. And so we, we pivoted to our public spaces and I watched people coming in and how it became uh, so therapeutic during COVID, but also during uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's something about nature that has healing power but we found other ways of uh, providing healing. And so uh, we just uh, looked at parks as part of our healthcare system and said, well, if parks are part of our healthcare system, all the doctors saying walk in the park if you wanna get better, then we knew uh, it's not just for physical, but also for mental healing. And so we pivoted very quickly. In fact, uh, I have a sign over there. We put a thousand signs all over New York City. Let me get it for a second, because I all want you to okay. see what I mean. While you're getting that, I'll, I'll just add you. If my wife with, uh, works with the San Diego River Park. Uh, that link, COVID has, has helped us all realize how important parks are to um, public and mental health. This is in reverse, but we put a thousand of these trees on, on trees all over New York City. I know it's backwards, but uh -huh. we just wanna make sure that our parks can heal. Our trees are kind of like healthcare workers. And so, because you couldn't hug anybody COVID, we put these on trees, said, it's okay to hug me. So when I said our staff wanted to pivot to rethink how we can offer our parks as sanctuaries of sanity for places of healing and joy, uh, that we decided to come up with some creative ideas about what we can do. So that was one of our initiatives that just went up maybe a month ago. And so again, we put them around a thousand trees around New York City to say it's okay to hug me. And it's kind of a fun thing because people call tree huggers, but we want to show the light side, but, yeah. but just to show that these, these our public spaces are places because through COVID, they, they were people's offices, their gym, uh, it was their wedding venue, showers, birthday parties. And I watched people walk into Central Park and you just saw the stress just drip off their bodies the minute they walked into the park. And so we knew that parks had this healing power. And that's when I said, we got to really talk about parks. And actually, I wrote an article recently, and it's going to be in a little section of the book about parks being part of our healthcare system. And we need to really think differently that way. So that's where that it came out of a personal emotion of going through the personal trauma of 2020. Uh, and then out of that, you know, came the awakening that uh, these are spaces for healing. And then at Juneteenth Grove, wow, that is now heavily visited. Uh, people have a sense of pride. The park is beautiful. Those benches, 
And now they're doing it in other parks. Uh, and like I said, tomorrow we're naming another 17. So, so acknowledging that you exist is also part of the healing process. And I learned the difference between stress and trauma and then generational trauma of racism. And so that's why we pivoted to think very differently about how parks can help heal. Well, let me ask two, two last questions here. One is a, a question that every major city uh, is grappling with. Um, it certainly is a, an issue here in San Diego. It's very acute in Los Angeles, and, and I imagine an issue in New York too, is, is talking about mental health and, and um, accessibility is, is working with the homeless population. Yep. Uh, what, hey. Any advice there? <laughs> uh, we're part of, actually is going on right now, the mayor has uh, a team that meets weekly on homeless issues, I'm on that team. Uh, so we work with homeless services and we work with parks and, and other places to reach out to those uh, to see if they would like services. People are welcome in our parks, all people, including homeless. Now, we don't allow encampments. You cannot stay in a park overnight. But if you do not have a home and you want to sit in our park, you can. Some people may have an issue with that, but you can so long as you follow the park rules. I want to share a story with you that really got me and struck me, which made me think very differently about this issue. We opened up, a, we had someone fund a waterfall restoration in Morningside Park, one of the Umstead Parks in Northern Manhattan. And as we're leaving, the woman who headed up the garden club handed me about 33 cents. And I'm like, what is this for? She said, oh, the homeless man over there wants to donate this to the park because this is where he comes every day to feel alive, to watch that waterfall. And I'm like, wow. And somebody might dial 311 to say, excuse me, there's a man who appears to be homeless in the park. Parks are for all. And last I checked, teenagers are part of all and people without a home are part of all. Now, let me explain again. We uh, do not allow anyone to stay in a park when a park is closed. You will be removed or given a summons. Or if you have an encampment, it will be removed uh, under certain rules. Uh, but we have to realize that we have to coexist, find solutions. But in New York City, we're very aggressive at our outreach to get the mental health services, to get them uh, other services, or even to help them find housing. So we have a team going out there and we're very, very aggressive about it. And we actually know some of the chronic ones that just refuse any help. We just keep trying until we break through. Mm, that's great. And my last question is, um, I, you know, we're a young foundation, San Diego Parks Foundation, we're just uh, two or three years old. Uh, and you've worked with foundations, of course, in New York, but also you're familiar with uh, how foundations work in other cities around the country. Um, what advice do you have for foundations like us and, and how to be most effective in working with the parks? Well, I heard Michelle's presentation up front, you're doing the right thing. Um, we have, someone asked a question about our volunteers. We have a group called Partnership for Parks and as part of the Parks, our Parks Foundation, uh, and we're partners. Uh, we actually fund, the foundation funds our outreach coordinator and we fund the other half. So we have kind of that relationship between one another. Uh, but I would say just make sure like the other groups do, they go to city council and, I'm sorry, they advocate uh, for more funding. They had this campaign called Play Fair and they advocate to city council that they wanted more money for people to care for parks. Secondly, uh, the volunteer events. That's something you can reach out to show that on those local parks, uh, you can help do the outreach. Uh, we have what's called It's My Park Day. Like I said, we have over 1,800 community groups that come out to volunteer. It's called Pitch In uh, Campaign, to pitch in your trash. So uh, I still encourage you uh, to go out there, um, uh, to be close partners with the Parks Department. Um, find out how you can uh, address some of those local partners uh, because everyone loves a park. So I think for a foundation, uh, everything you're doing so far that I've seen that was mentioned at the introduction, you're doing the right thing. So I commend you for the work you're doing because we cannot do the work we do without a foundation like the San Diego Parks Foundation. Well, thank, thank you. And I maybe related to that, uh, or I'll try to make the link. Uh, there's a, uh, Marie asked a, a question. There's a new state law in California that allows vending in parks and sidewalks. And maybe some of that might be sponsored by a foundation in conservancy in some places. Uh, some would be just commercial. 
uh, what's, what's the city's New York's approach to that? Uh, we allow vending those concessions. Uh, we have it's split cultural affairs because we have disabled veterans, which is a whole other, it goes back to the civil war. They found a loophole. So there are some vendors that can vend on our streets, but we do allow it. We permit it. And that cash goes back to the general revenue. Uh, the other point I was going to add is that what the foundation can do, which I'm sure the city cannot do, is raise funds. Mm -hmm. And I am sure if you go out to some of the billionaires, which I'm sure live in the region, establish a campaign or a capital campaign for specific parks. For example, if you did this initiative uh, to say that here are some parks that have been neglected, we'd like to redo them uh, to be state of the art and go out to a millionaire or billionaire, I'm almost certain as a foundation, you could raise funds. It's very difficult for the city to do that unless they create some kind of public-private partnership to do it. But that's another role that you can play. You can identify these parts that have been neglected, go out to some of these millionaires and billionaires and say, hey, for $4 million, for $3 million, you can change the lives of people in this neighborhood. So I think that's certainly another role you can play. And our foundations, in fact, do that. Well, on that note, um, I know we're approaching our end here. And I just want to thank you profusely uh, Mitch, uh, this, I, I think you've uh, influenced a lot of thinking here, stimulated a lot of thinking uh, here amongst us in San Diego. And 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 uh, you'll, hopefully you'll be out here next year, the APA National yes, Conference. Be out there next year in month. San Diego in the spring. Yes, so. I've been many times, as you know, and I can't wait. I'm a runner, so I'm excited because uh, I think I started... I'm trying to think I'm a marathon runner. I can't remember if I ran in. Come out for the rock and roll marathon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm doing two this year. I'm done. That's, that's, <laughs> this is my last two and I'm out. Uh, but thank you. Thank you all. And uh, so you all know I'll be moving on to work uh, in the private sector in about a month. Uh, and so hopefully I'll be get to do this in all places around the country. So uh, particularly yeah. the equity work. That to me is something I'm very passionate about. That's great. That's great. Right. And, and, and for everyone uh, listening in, thank you for spending your morning with us. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And um, uh, do think of us at the San Diego Parks Foundation on uh, .org. And uh, Catherine put in the chat uh, links to us. And um, and we're, we're building a we're, we're hoping to work with everyone to help uh, do a little bit to build a, a better future for San Diego. Thanks all. Thanks, Mitch. All right. Thank you. Thank you.